Ephesians chapter 2. All right. As we've been going through this so far, we've seen God's plan and His formation of the church, the body of Christ, in eternity past. That the church isn't something that took God by surprise. Oh, you know, Jesus you know, was rejected um, by some of the leadership class in Israel, so He just had to come up with the church. No, that, wasn't, that was not the way it happened. He had planned this before the foundation of the world. That the church would be called out. They'd be elect. That they'd be redeemed. That they'd be given an inheritance, Jew and Gentile together, with God forever in His kingdom. And we've been going through that so far. And remember, Paul's prayer for them, for the church, wasn't one of God give them peace to get this, you know, get them through the daily trials of everyday life. Paul's prayer was not, Lord, give them a little bit more finances so they can just make it by in this earth. You know, God, give them some strength to get going. No, that was not his prayer for them. His prayer for the church, remember in chapter 1, was made up of them understanding who they are in Jesus Christ. God asked that their eyes would be open. Paul asked God that their eyes would be open, that they might understand who they are in Jesus Christ and just what God has done for them in the person of Jesus Christ. God, P- Paul doesn't pray for them anything else but that. Lord, because if God, excuse me, Paul knows if they understand that, then all the other things will fall into place. The finances, the stress issues, the, uh, you know, the, everything else that goes on, job issues, everything else. If you know who you are in Jesus Christ, everything else just falls into place. And that's what Paul prays for them in chapter 1. Now remember, as we rolled out of chapter 1 into chapter 2, he talks about them in the past. You were this in the past, but now because you're in Jesus Christ, you are His workmanship. You have been saved, saved by grace through faith. Not any of your works, not anything you have done. God has loved you. He's saved you. He's given you a new life, a new course, eternal life. Now everything you do from that time forward counts for all of eternity. Right? And then as he digs a little deeper, and we're going to move into this, in verse 11 through 22, he says, he basically addresses the church, and he addresses the Gentiles in the church. Mainly the, church, mainly the church at Ephesus was made up of Gentiles. There were some Jewish believers there. And he addresses them and he wants them to understand just what they were outside of Christ and just what they are in Christ. Now before I get into that, I want to ask you a couple questions. As we look out into the world, as we look, you know, turn the news on, whatever it is, just driving down the street, you see disunity, You don't see much peace, not much inclusion. You see pain. And if there is a God, wouldn't He be a God of equality? Right? If there is a God, wouldn't He be a God of unity? If there is a God, wouldn't He be a God of peace? If there is a God, wouldn't He be a God of inclusion? If there is a God, wouldn't He be a God that invites all people? If there is a God... Wouldn't He be a God that sees everybody the same? No, regardless of race. If there is a God, wouldn't He be a God that sees everybody the same regardless of socioeconomic economic status? If there is a God, wouldn't He be that kind of a God? Well, the answer to that is yes. And study every other religion out there and their gods, the answer to that question is No. The true God, the living God, the only God, the answer to all those questions is yes. He is a God of inclusion. He is a God of unity. He is a God that, 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 that doesn't judge on the basis of one's socioeconomic status. He is a God that doesn't judge on the basis of race, nationality, whatever it is. And that's what Paul's explaining to them in verse 11 through 22. Let's read. Wherefore, remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Now listen, right away you say, Pastor Matt, doesn't that seem to go against everything you just said? 
Because Paul starts bringing up here circumcision, uncircumcision. What was, what was circumcision? It was a special covenant between God and the Jewish people. That God said basically the symbolism is this is how close the male part, right? It's an it's a organ of intimacy. This is how close I am with my people. But also, my people will be cut off if they cut me off. Right? The foreskin of their flesh. And it was a symbol of the closeness of God with His people. And there's other symbols you know, that go along with that. But that was one of the main ones. And, and, and Paul says, Don't you remember to the Gentile audience in the church that you in time past were Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision. Now what happened? The Jewish people would go around and they really believed that all Gentile people, and that's a Gentile again is anybody who is not a pure Jew. All Gentile people would just basically sticks in, in stubble for the fires of hell. That's what they believed. That the Gentile nations were created to be fodder and fuel for hell. That's what they thought. Now they were a little off because of the Scriptures tell us as you're moving through the Old Testament that Israel was to be a light to the world. They were to be a peculiar people, separate, distinct, morally than the rest of the world. God said, you're my people, peculiar people, just like we're called the peculiar people. We're called the set-apart people, right? And the purpose of Israel was to do what? To shine as a light, like Jesus was a light, to lighten the Gentiles in the glory of God's people, Israel. Right? That Israel's main purpose was to, yes, to be that special people of God, but to show the world, man, these people must have the living God. The true God. They must be a witness for the true God. Now we know through Israel's history, they lived up to that sometimes, but a lot of times they didn't. And they started worshiping false, falsely the way the Gentiles did. The Gentiles many times became more of an influence on them than they were on them. And that's what happened. And Paul says, you and the Gentile, the, the, the Gentile part of the church, don't you remember that you were outside the camp? Don't you remember that you were considered second class? Don't you remember that? Third class, fourth class, way back. It was Israel, God's people, in, in their minds, and that was it. He says, don't you remember what you were considered before? And then he goes in and he explains to them the heart of God. Just what God has done. Wherefore, remember... By the way, don't ever forget what Jesus Christ has done for you. Don't ever get so cavalier in your Christian walks that you don't remember just what He's brought you out of and brought you from and brought you into. Remember that ye being in time, listen, in time past, Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. Now, Paul is honest with them. He basically tells them in times past, if you weren't a Jew, you were outside the camp. Or if you didn't at least worship the Jewish God, the only God, Jehovah, you were outside the camp. Or if you didn't look in from the outside and say, hey, they got the truth. I need that truth. Paul says you were outside the camp. That's what he tells them. Now look what he says. You were aliens. What's an alien? Foreign. Separate. We talk about illegal aliens. Oh, you know, what are we going to do about it? And the whole, you know, thing that goes on in politics about it. What are we going to do? Do we send them out? Do we keep them? And this and that. I went to a pastor's conference one time and that, that, that question came up to some of the pastors that have been ministering for years. Basically, this is what they answered. They said, just preach the gospel. Just preach the gospel because God's kingdom is so much bigger than the United States. It is. And once they receive the gospel and they start to learn about Jesus Christ, God convicts them about doing the wrong thing, about coming into a nation illegally. Then you know what? God will work on their heart and they'll go back. 
Just preach the gospel. Because there's no distinction in God's kingdom. Right? He said you were aliens. You were separated. You were outside the camp. Now watch. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. Now who got the covenants? Who got the promises? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, right? I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse those who curse you. David, Jew, Jewish king. They were God's chosen people. Everybody else was outside the camp. Now, they were supposed to be a light to those outside the camp. They were supposed to be different and distinct to those outside the camp. Right? But Paul says, this is what you were. But look what God had in mind from before the foundation of the world. Watch what he says. Having no hope and without God in the world. Now listen to this. Alienation between humans is a result of alienation from God. Okay? People can't get along with one another because they can't get along with God. See, there's a problem vertically between people and God. Right? Even Jesus, when He came, He said what? He came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But even Jesus, when He was a light, He was a Jew, He was living under all the covenants and all the promises. He fulfilled them all. What did He do when He had His earthly ministry? What did He do when there were Gentiles around? What did He do? He preached to them. He healed them. He saved them. Right? And it says they were without hope and without God. Paul basically says the Jews had the true, the living, and the only God. And anybody who does not have that God is without hope. No hope. And they don't know God. Right? Now listen to me. We're going to read in a minute how God makes us one, Jew and Gentile together, in Jesus Christ. And that was His plan. Because if there is a God, He is a God of unity. If there is a God, He is a God of inclusion. That is His plan. But listen, if you don't have the true and living God, there's no hope. If you don't have the true and living God, you're without God, you're without hope. Listen, when you look out at the world, there's no hope. There's no hope outside of Jesus Christ. And I think about this sometimes. And then sometimes I talk, to the, you know, I talk to my wife, I remember a couple of weeks ago, talking to her about this and just thinking, if there's no Jesus Christ, if there's no cross, if there's no redemption, there's no hope. Nothing. Nothing. As good as you can make life out to be, for however many years you get to live, like I said, I'm 38, about half my life's over. Okay? If I live to the average lifespan of, of, of human beings, of males, 74 to 76 is the average, I guess. But if all there is is this life and there's no Jesus, there's no cross, there's no Holy Spirit, there's no heaven, then there's no hope. And people are walking around living this life, right? With no hope. And it's just so sad. And you watch them go throughout this life and, you know, you get your first car, you get your first home, you get married, you have kids, this and that. And listen, the end of it is just you die. If there's no Jesus Christ. If there's no God. Then there's no hope. That's the bottom line. It has to end, right? Dude, it, it's simple. It, it's a simple equation. Everything is going to end in death. If there's no God, if there's no Jesus, if there's no cross, if there's no Holy Spirit, if there's no heaven, then there's just death. That's all there is. No hope. Nothing. People have all kinds of false hope. And I'll tell you about it. 
You talk to people about eternity, this is what they'll tell you. Well, you know, I don't know about Jesus and God. I believe there's a God. Yeah, how did everything get here? Well, what, what, what's it going to be like? What's heaven? Well, it's a state of being. You'll be there and, and you'll see your loved ones and that first person you fell in love with, you know, you'll finally have that nice relationship that you had for your first month and a half that you met each other. Really, that's what a lot of people think. And those of you who have children, you'll finally, you know, be, be with your children and, and it'll be peaceful and everything will be the way it's supposed to be. It's more of like a family kind of heavenly thing going on. God's like out of the picture somewhere else. When I talk, that's what they say. Oh, I'm going to be with aunt so-and-so or this one. What about God? Yeah, yeah, God, God, God. Kind of like salvation by death. You're saved because you die. You're just with your, you're just with your loved ones or whoever. There's no hope in that. Outside of Jesus Christ, there's no hope. Now, in Jesus Christ, you will see your loved ones if they knew Jesus Christ. That's what Paul tells the church at Thessalonica. He tells them, I don't want you to sorrow like those who have what? No hope. Why does he say those who have no hope? Because those who don't know Jesus have no hope. But you have hope because you know Jesus. He goes, I don't want you to sorrow. Because if you believe that Jesus died and rose again, the dead who went before you who knew Jesus, God will bring with him and there's going to be resurrection for them when he comes. You have hope. Those who don't know Jesus have no hope. And Paul's speaking from a vantage point of the past. You Gentiles, you didn't know the true God. You didn't fully understand Him. You didn't get it. But now, verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who are sometimes were, listen, far off, we just preached about this in Zechariah, that when the branch comes, that's a a title for the Messiah Jesus, He'll take those who are are far off, close to Him, those are Gentiles, But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. But now. Verse 4. But God. God is our only hope. He's the only hope of anybody. He is the answer. If there is a true God, if there is a living God, if He is there, you know, is there a way? Is there a rescuer? Is there somebody who can get us there? Yes, but God. He's the only one. He made it happen and that's why He gets all the glory. Understand? And He shares His glory with you. He says, listen, but now in Christ Jesus, listen, what does it say? It doesn't say in Allah or in Muhammad, His prophet. It doesn't say in Confucius, in everything else, in the name of a church, in Calvary Chapel, in the four square Pentecostals, in the Baptist church, it says, in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. You who are sometimes afar off, you are made nigh because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Right? For God so loved the world. He shed His own blood for the world. And we're brought nigh, we're brought close because of what He did. In the context here, it's he's bringing Jew and Gentile together in unity. Because if there is a God, he is a God of inclusion. He is a God of unity. He isn't a God that rates people on, well, you're a Jew, you're a Gentile. You're a this, you're a that. You're an Indian, you're an African. You're a Caucasian, you're whatever else. Couldn't think of them fast enough. You think of them for me. Right? Because He is a God of inclusion. God wants all people to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But the opposite is true. If you don't know Christ Jesus, then you're outside. Is that God's heart? No. He wants all people to come close. Verse 14. Listen. For He is our peace who hath made, listen, both one... And hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. 
What's that middle wall of partition? Obviously, Paul's got to be alluding to here. Listen, in the temple precincts, you had the court of women, and then you had this wall. It's about three feet high. And basically what the Jewish people said to the Gentiles, if you come beyond this wall, it could mean your life. And they would put signs up. Saying, we're God in the holiness of God. We have the true and living God. You guys stay out there. And Paul says God has break, broken that down. He's broken it down. He's made us one in Jesus Christ. Now listen, sometimes the, the church goes too far with this. Some of the churches who believe in covenant theology, they say that, well, you know what? Now there's no more Jewish people as a race. God's angry at them because they crucified Jesus. That's what they say. Okay? And so because God's angry with them, God fulfills all the national promises to Israel and the church. So we're the Israel of God. There is no more Israel. Read your Bible. The Bible talks more about Israel and the restoration of Israel than it does their Messiah, by the way. Read it. Now, we know the Messiah is going to do all that. But you can't just throw all that out the window, especially in Romans 11. What, is God, what, what does God say through Paul? He goes, as, has God, is he forgotten about? Is he cast off his people with, with whom he foreknew? He goes, no, God forbid. He goes, absolutely not. A partial blindness has fallen upon Israel to provoke them to jealousy, the Scriptures say. That when Jewish people see the church, now listen, this is where we falter sometimes. They should say, man, maybe they do have the Messiah. There, is there something different about them? But is there something different about us that we're living as lights that way? For he is our peace. He hath both, listen, who hath made both one. And hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Listen, only the church, and I say this, and I think about this, I say this all the time, only the church of Jesus Christ, that's spirit-filled, is going to have people in it from different socioeconomic backgrounds, different races, different nationalities, and God says, put them all in there and love one another and get along. That doesn't work anywhere else. Politicians have been trying to make that work forever, but it doesn't work. They can try to make it work. They can put laws in place, but it does not work. It only works in Jesus Christ. Where God takes you from this background, poor, down and out, and He takes someone else from a rich background, and He says, you love one another. You from this background, this nationality, and you from this total opposite... Opposite parts of the world. And he says, now you're one in Jesus Christ. That can only happen in the church. Because in our flesh, we want to build walls. We want to make separation. Listen, I'll, I'll give it to you. What is the first... You, hear me, you heard me say this before. What is the first thing we ask people? Guys do this. When we get to know them. Hey, what do you do for work? What do you do? Well, I clean toilets. Oh, good, good, good feel. But you know, some people look down on that. You didn't arrive in life. Really? It's the first thing you ask. What do you do for a living? Well, what do you do? Does that matter to God? Remember, James said the church, <laughs> they were having a problem with this. The church was poor. They needed some fiscal help. And what was going on was, finally, when someone rich came in, they said, come sit up front. Put a choice ring on his finger. Set him apart. And James says, are you not partial? Is that the way God thinks? Is that the way God does things? Absolutely not. We're all one in Jesus Christ. Amen. But the church is the only place where that is going to work because God is a God of inclusion. He is a God of unity. He is a God of peace. Jesus made peace, verse 14. Look in verse 15. Having abolished in His flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in Himself of twain, this is Jew and Gentile, one new man, that means in quality, one new man, so making peace. Listen, the words having abolished literally mean inoperative. 
that it's inoperative now. There's no more Jew, Gentile. There's no more you worship over here, you stay out there. In Jesus Christ, we worship the same God. We all have gifts. We all come together. Listen, I love this. It's, this is the same term that Paul uses in his other epistles. And it says, having abolished death. That when a Christian dies, he does not die. Christ abolished death. He who believes in me shall never die. When a Christian dies, they don't die. Christ abolished death. You go through the veil to the other side with Christ forever. Having abolished in his flesh because of Christ's death on the cross, the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might, listen, reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. He says, Jesus Christ, death on the cross and his shed blood, brings Jew and Gentile together. Is Jesus Christ's blood not powerful enough to save everybody? Only the Jews? No. All the Gentiles too. Salvation is what? It was to the Jew first, but also to the Gentile, right? Right? I want, to, I want you to see something. He uses the word one a lot. Verse 18, he says, one spirit. Verse 16, one body. That's us together. Verse 15, one new man in quality. Verse 14, now we're both one together. You think God's trying to tell us something? That we're one in Jesus Christ? Jew, Gentile, whatever you are. We're one in Jesus Christ. Isn't this what Jesus prayed in John 17? What did he pray in John 17? He said, for, first he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify yourself, right? Glorify your son that your son also may glorify thee, he says. And as you read on through that prayer in John chapter 17, you know what he says? Father, I want them to be one just like we are one. Right? I want them to be one just like we're one. Amazing. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You got three there, but you really got one. I can't figure it out. Right? Jesus prays in John 17 that I want all of our, your people, God, to be one, to be unified, to have the same heart, the same mind. Verse 17. And he came and preached peace to you, which were, uh, there it is again, afar off, and to them that were nigh. He said to the Jews, they, he preached peace, and to the Gentiles who were afar off. For through Him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Listen, access. Again, we're in the business sometimes of putting up walls. And you'll hear me sometimes my kids will run in the office, they'll run in the office, they'll run in the office, they'll run in the office. I'll say, all right, I'm studying. Give me, give me a few minutes. You, you, you got to go out there. You gotta, but they know they have access to me. They know they can come in. They know they can just run in. I, I'll tell them a thousand times, give me a few minutes. They know they have access to their Father. That's the same access we have to the Father. Right? Boldly into the throne of grace we can come with access to God. See, even the Jews in the Old Testament, they didn't have full access the high priest and the sacrificial system was a go-between for them to worship the true God. They didn't have full access. Remember when, when God thundered, right? On Mount Sinai. He said, don't come near the mountain. Don't even let an animal touch the mountain because if it touches it, it's going to die. Because I'm here and I'm holy. Stay away. Stay back. And they said, Moses, you know what? You go talk to him for us. That's what he said. And Moses did. And that's why the Bible says God will raise up a prophet like unto Moses. One that can be a go-between Jesus Christ. Right? Right? They didn't have full access. Even the priest could only have access into the Holy of Holies one day a year. And he went in with fear and trembling. But not now. 
because of what Jesus did on the cross, all Jewish people, all Gentile people, anybody can have direct access to God. Let me tell you how this works. Sometimes we get so stressed out throughout the day. It gets difficult. We got things on our mind. We got family. We got finances, issues. You know, you're just getting rolling on good and then bang, you get a flat tire. And then you're sitting on the side of the road and you're wondering, why is this happening? What's going on? Lord, I, I was just getting going. But you know you have access you know, as you're sitting on the side of the road, you can literally just close your eyes and just talk to God and put everything else out. And I don't know how it happens, but I know that when you do that and you put everything else out, the finances, the flat tire, the kids, jobs, bosses, ministries, whatever else it is, all I know, I don't know how it happens, but when you sit there and you put everything else out and you really focus on Jesus Christ and the living God, somehow heaven meets earth. That's what happens. And you enter into the Holy of Holies. You enter right in. You come right into His presence. Listen. I want to show you something. It says this in verse 22 of Hebrews. But you are come when we worship unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly, listen, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better than that of Abel. What's he talking about? He says, when we come into the Holy of Holies, when we come to worship, whether in an assembly or in private, you come right into heaven's throne where the myriads of angels are worshiping God. Where Peter, Paul, Noah, Adam, name them all, probably even Nebuchadnezzar, by the way, they're there worshiping God. That's where you go. And somehow he heaven meets earth. And you enter right in and you have access to God. It's no longer you have to go through a priest or a go-between or somebody else or you have to give a certain amount of money or do a certain amount of works or anything else to get to God. You don't have to do that. Jesus abolished God. All of that. That means he rendered it inoperative. And we can come right in to the Holy of Holies and we can cry, Abba, Father, access to God. And when God never does to me, sometimes I do to my own kids, get out, give me some more time to study. Oh, you keep coming in here. My kids are hyper. If you, if you don't know, my mind goes 100 miles an hour. That's, damn me. It's, it's kind of aggravating. But... Didn't I, just tell you, didn't I just tell you that? They're in. Back, in and out. Give me a few minutes. God never does that to me. Get in. Give me some time. I'm dealing with your sister. I'm dealing with your brother on this side of the world right now. I don't know how God does it, but he deals with all his people at the same time. At the same time, and he has, he, he's God, right? And he pays just as much attention to you when you come in than to the other person that lives all the way on the other side of the world with a whole different set of circumstances. I don't know how he does it, but he does it. For through Him we both have access, verse 18, by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore, because of everything I just said, now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners. Again, this is to the Gentiles in the church, but your fellow citizens. You were aliens, you were strangers, you were foreigners, you were separated, you were pushed out, there were walls put up, everything else but no more. You were aliens, now you're fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God. You know what that means? The household of God to the Jewish mind. You're God's kids. All of you are God's kids. Now watch what he says here. You see, you see the foundation of God's household you see the formation of God's household and you see the function of God's household. 
the foundation, verse 20. And you're all built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone. So, Pastor Matt, are we built more on the prophets in the Old Testament or on the apostles in the New Testament? Is it more about the Old Testament and the Jewish people or more about the apostles and the new? I don't know. It says both. That's the foundation that we're built on. That's why we study the whole Bible here at Calvary Chapel. We don't say, you know, it's not just New Testament Sunday, though we teach primarily to the New Testament. We teach to the Old Testament too. Both. We don't just cut half the Bible and more than half the Bible and throw it out. The foundation is upon what? The apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone. We're here. Yes, because it goes all the way back to the church fathers. It goes all the way back to Peter and Paul. It goes all the way back to Jesus, to John the Baptist. It goes back further than that, all the way back to Abraham. That's why we're here. That's the foundation that we're built on. Now look at the formation. In whom all the building fitly framed together grows up into a holy temple in the Lord. You see what he says? Now listen, what's he talking about? Is he talking about a literal building? No. Is he talking about actual stones and clay and wood? That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about you. He's talking about people. See, the things that matter so much to us on this earth, the stone, the clay, the building materials, to God, right? To God, that means nothing. What means something to God is you. You make up His temple. You are His people. And look what he says. He says it's what? Fitly framed together. It's fitly framed together. Listen, I believe believe each local church is fitly framed together. Everybody has different gifts, different functions in each church. All of us do. As a whole, God's people are fitly framed together. You know what that means? That means God had a master plan before the foundation of the world to make a holy habitation. You'll see in the last verse. And you were involved in that plan. And without you, listen, when an engineer designs a building, right? And he puts those plans together and the architect gets involved and all that's going on. Every screw has a place. Every nail, every staple, every piece of wood, every bit of concrete, everything that's going on in it has a meaning and a reason for it. Right? That's what God says. That God's building wouldn't be fitly framed together if one piece was missing. If you're a screw, we're going to have a screw loose, right? We all have screw, you know, screws loose. Just wanted to wake you up a little bit. God's building wouldn't be fitly framed together, His holy habitation, if one little piece was missing from the Jews and from the Gentiles. God's building would not be complete if one little piece, one little staple, one little curtain, whatever it is you are, it would not be complete unless you were part of it. In whom all the building fitly framed together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Why is it a holy temple? Because Christ fills it. Watch. In whom you also, listen, this is the function of God's habitation, in whom you also are built it together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Somehow, some way, God planned it that before the foundation of the world, Jew and Gentile were going to be together. Every little piece, everybody who's saved, all the way from Adam to the end of time is going to be a holy habitation for God to fill. 
That's why the Bible says we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power is not of us, but it's of God. Right? That means, listen, you were created to be filled with God. You were created to be overflowed with God. Right? That's why you're here. That's why you were created. That's what God's plan was, to be able to fill you. Paul said, remember Ephesians 1, it was a mystery in the past, but what? God's made it clear in the New Testament that His own Spirit is going to fill His own people, Jew and Gentile, together. Forever. And listen to me, that's why when the things go on in our life and we get stressed out and we can't take it anymore and this is going on and this and that, we weren't made to carry those burdens. We can't carry those burdens, but we were made to be filled with God who can carry all the burdens. Right? Can't carry them. And, and, and what happens when we get stressed out and we start to lose it and things go on in our life and we fall back into sin, what happens is that we're not letting God fill us the way He wants to. Because we're all fitly framed together. A habitation, a house for God. That's you. That's me. 